Welcome to lecture 8.1, Modeling with Nonlinear Systems. Now, most systems of ODEs that arise in practice are nonlinear. The most common techniques of analysis of these is to find the steady states and then to linearize them at the steady states. Once you do this, then as before, most defining properties are determined by the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the resulting linear system. And this is what we'll do in the next few lectures. But in this lecture, I just want to start by showing you a number of nonlinear models that naturally arise. Let's begin with the popular SIR model from epidemiology, which was proposed in the early 1900s. For this, let's consider an epidemic or a disease that spreads through a population, something like the common cold or the flu, or it could be something more serious. So S of t represents the number of susceptible people at time t. Those are people who are healthy and have not yet been infected. I of t is the number of infected people at time t. That represents the people who are currently sick. And then R of t represents the number of recovered people at time t. Those are the people who have gotten the disease and now have an immunity to it. And finally, let's assume that there are n susceptible or unaffected people initially. So let's write down some differential equations for this. The first thing to understand is that people transition between these states. You start in the susceptible state, you transition to the infected state, or infectious as some people say, and then you transition to the recovered state like this. So let's write down equations for ds dt for di dt and for dr dt. So let's start with the first one, ds dt, the rate of change that people become susceptible. So this is going to be negative because nobody is entering this state and everybody is leaving. And the people who are leaving are the ones who are getting sick. So, so how do you model this? Well, the number of people that are, or I should say, the rate that people are getting sick is proportional to two things, I claim. First of all, the number of people who ha are in the susceptible state. So if you have 100 sick people, or if you have 100 healthy people on campus in the middle of flu season, and you double that number, you have 200, then you're roughly going to have twice as many people who get sick in the next week, because there's twice as many people um, to infect. Also, it should be proportional to the number of infectious people on campus. So if you, if you double the amount of people who are sick, you're going to roughly double the amount of people that get infected the next week. And this is, of course, an approximation, but we're going to say that this is it's, it's accurate. So DSDT is some constant alpha, or negative alpha, times S times I. That's what it means to be proportional to both S and I. So let's put alpha here. That represents the rate of the transition rate. Next, di dt. So this is going to think of this as rate in minus rate out. So the rate in is just the same thing we have here, but with a positive sign. So we have alpha s i, and then the rate out is the transit the rate that people become recovered. So this, I claim, is just proportional to the number of infected people. So let's suppose you have a disease like the flu that lasts on average 10 days. Then each day, roughly 10%, the reciprocal of that, 10% of, or one-tenth of the people who are sick become recovered. So we're going to say that we're going to put a negative i, or gamma times i here. So gamma is the rate that people are going from this state to that state. It should be negative because people are leaving the state i. And this gamma represents, again, the reciprocal of the length of the, the duration, average duration, of the disease. And finally, dr dt, this is just the negative of this term because people are just entering the r state and nothing else. So this is positive gamma times i. So this represents our system, that mo or this is our model, 
And let's put some initial conditions. So if there are n susceptible people, then we have s of 0 equals n. Let's suppose that we have one infectious person. Otherwise, the disease will never start. So this is our patient 0. And let's suppose that nobody starts with the immunity. Now, this might change. You know, you might vaccinate people, and so that might give you fewer susceptibles and more recovered, or you might have multiple infectious people originally. Um, but let's just start here. Okay, so this is our model. Now, how do we validate it? Well, let's, uh, let's plot what this is going to look. This is something you can solve using MATLAB. You can plot it. And if you do that, then here's what it'll look like. So you start with the number of susceptible people, starts out at n, and that will go down like this. So this is s of t. Now the number of infectious people is going to start at 1, and then it's going to go up, and then it's going to go down, and eventually go down to 0. Everyone eventually becomes recovered. And finally, well, Let's see, let's write that here. And then finally, the number of recovered people starts at 0, and it's going to go up to here. Now, several comments. It's, there's usually a gap right here. This, the number of susceptibles does not usually go down to 0. Think about the swine flu that happened in uh, some, sometime around 2009, 2010. Remember that? Now, I never got the sw swine flu, so I am still in the susceptible crowd. I don't have the immunity to that. So this little gap right here, I'm going to call that a, a gap, represents the number of people who never got sick. Similarly, there's a little gap up here. So this, I guess I didn't label this as recovered people. So this gap is people who never got sick. So these is represented up here because I didn't get the swine flu, so I am not in the recovered state. What else can we say? So where does this local minimum or this maximum happen? So that's going to happen when DIDT is equal to zero. So when that is equal to zero. Let's let's try to understand that. Let's use red. Okay, so um, zero. Let's write it like this. I prime equals zero. So let's set this equal to zero, and we get alpha S I minus gamma I. So we can we can solve. We can factor out an. Let's see. How do we do this? Factor out an I, and we get zero equals alpha s minus gamma times i. So that happens. And just to be clear, there, there should not be a... It looked like there was a prime there. That shouldn't be there. Um, so oh, that i is not going to be 0. So that happens we can set this equal to 0. And we get that s equals gamma over alpha. So in other words, how do we want to do this? So right here, this maximum occurs when the number of susceptible people is equal to gamma over alpha. So when, when s is bigger than gamma over alpha, then I prime is, well, what can we say? Then the population is growing. So the population is, is growing. And when S is less than gamma over alpha, so when S is bigger than gamma over alpha, so when we are, we are up here, the, pop, the infection is growing because I prime is positive. So I just mean I prime is positive. And when S is less than this, 
then it is shrinking. Because I prime is negative. So this is called a this is called a threshold right here. And uh let's see what else do we want to say? So at some point in the middle of the flu season, there are so many people who are sick and there are so few people who have who are st still uninfected that the people who are sick aren't infecting enough people to keep the disease spreading. So the disease will, at that point, die out and eventually go away. So the last thing I want to say about this is there is a quantity called the basic reproductive number. So this is R. It's, I'm going to do a script R to distinguish it from this R. And this is equal to, oops, is equal to alpha over gamma times S naught times the initial number of susceptible people. So let's, if we define this quantity, so th this physic, I'm not going to go over the derivation for this, but this represents the number of people that an initially infected person will infect um, throughout the course uh, that he or she has the disease. So if, if I am patient zero, if I am the first person to get the swine flu, then how many people do I infect overall? And if this quantity is less than one, then the infection dies, the disease dies out and it goes away. But if it's greater than one, then the infection uh, grows. And again, I'm not gonna derive this, but so what you can do is you can me measure this quantity, and if this quantity is less than one, then think of it as like a spark that does not catch a forest fire from exploding. So the disease just peters out right away. But if this quantity, if me as patient zero infects more than one person on average, then I will infect multiple people, they will each infect multiple people, and so forth and eventually the disease is going to explode into some big epidemic. So this is called the basic reproductive number, and it's just equal to, and it's, again, I'm not going to go over the derivation of that. So um, it's hard to estimate or not for well-known diseases. People try, and it, it's estimated to be roughly 12 to 18 for the measles, 5 to 7 for smallpox and polio, 2 to 5 for HIV and SARS, 2 to 3 for the for a really bad bout of, of, of flu, like the 18, 1918 Spanish flu, and roughly one and a half to two and a half for Ebola. So what that say, says is for all of these diseases, unless we take precautions to like vaccinate people or isolate people, these diseases are going to explode and become epidemics where we have a large percentage of people who um, got, have gotten who have gotten the disease. Okay, so that's about all I want to say with the basic SIR model. Now I want to show you some variants of it. There are, not surprisingly, thousands and thousands of variants of the SIR model because there are thousands and thousands of diseases that all have slightly different properties. Here's a simple model called the SI model. So there's a lot of diseases, like herpes or HIV, that once you get infected, there's no cure. So you don't have a recovered state. You just have a susceptible and an infectious state, and it looks... So that you transition from S to I with rate alpha, and then you're stuck here. So here are those equations. Next, there's an SIS model, which describes a disease where there is no immunity. So once you get rid of the disease, you're just as susceptible as you were before you had it. Things like chlamydia. Once you get rid of chlamydia, you can get it again. You don't get an immunity to it. So there, you have two states, and you transition with rate alpha from susceptible to infectious, and then rate gamma back to susceptible. There is an SIRS model, which describes a disease with a finite time immunity, something like the common cold. So after you get healthy from the cold, you're not going to get the cold right away, but after a few months, you are just as infectious as someone who never got the cold in the first place. So here you have to add a transition from R to S, with some rate delta, and that arises with this term here, 
and this term up here. Another popular model is the more refined SEIR model and E represents exposed. So this is your incubation period. So maybe there's 24 hours when you've been infected but you're not showing any symptoms. So here's a system of differential equations that you get from that model. You can add bells and whistles to these models like birth and death rates. So let's suppose that People are born into the susceptible state with rate beta, so that arises with this positive term here. And people die from any state with rate uh, mu, I forgot what Greek letter that was, so something like, like this, though these negative terms are here. This is a more complicated model, but it, it models extra information. Now of course there are tons and tons of variants of this. You can assume or you can model the case where some babies are born into the infectious state or the recover state because sometimes the mother passes on a disease and sometimes mother does not. Or you can change up these constants to be different. It's reasonable to expect with some diseases that the death rate for a susceptible person is going to be different than the death rate for someone who is infectious. Of course it depends if, if the disease is something like pneumonia or a flu where you can die from or something else that's maybe like uh, an STD which is uh, irritating like herpes but it's not going to actually make you die sooner. Thus far all of the nonlinear models that we have seen have been from epidemiology. Now I want to show you another class of models from population dynamics. So we'll start with what's called the competitive Lukta-Volterra equations. So here we have two species, let's say maybe fish, that are competing for a limited food supply. So we have a pond and we have two species of fish and there is only so much food that these fish can eat. So let's let x of t and y of t be the populations of the two species. So let's assume that each species without the other one would grow logistically. So if we did this, that means that x prime would be some constant r, remember the logistic equation? Some constant r, say r1 times x times 1 minus x over m1. And m1, recall, is the maximum, or is the carrying capacity, or the maximum. And then y prime would be some other constant, r2 times y times 1 minus y over m2. Might be a different maximum. Maybe the fish are a different size. So this is what would happen if, so if species 2 died out, this would be the equation for species 1. And if species 1 died out, then this would be how species 2 would grow. But now, because they are both present, they take up room, so we have to add these two terms. We have to add some term S1 times XY up here and some S2 times XY down here. These are called mass action terms. And how do I want to say this? Um, yeah, so I'm going to show you another way to write this. So you, you could, if you want to, notice each of these terms has an X in it, so you can factor out an x. So you can write these. If you want to, you can write this as x, let's do it in red, x times, let's call it epsilon 1 minus, what is that? That's a sigma, sigma 1x minus alpha 1y. And so I'm just renaming my constants. And then this next equation is we can factor out a y and we get epsilon 2 minus sigma 2 y minus alpha 2 x. So obviously epsilon 1 here is equal to r1, sigma 1 is equal to r1 over m1 and so forth. So I'm just renaming my constants. This is a standard form 
put them in. And now let's look at what these terms represent. So this, this term right here represents, this is the decrease in, in the growth rate so the decrease in the growth rate of species one due to species two. So alpha one represents the per capita decline. So alpha one is the per capita decline. So how much is species 2 causing species 1 to, to decline in growth? And similarly, alpha 2 is the per capita decline of species 2 due to species 1. The next model I want to show you is often called the Lacta Volterra equation or just the predator-prey equation although as we'll see there are a number of different predator-prey equations. So now let's consider two species, one of which depends on the other as a food source. So let's say like foxes and rabbits, where foxes eat rabbits. So x of t is the population of the prey, so the, the rabbits, and y of t is the population of the predator. Now let's assume that in the absence of the other species, the prey grows exponentially, now, so that's not realistic forever, but at least without uh, the prey, the rabbits are going to grow exponentially in the short term. And the predator would decay exponentially. So it's going to taper off if you take away its food source. So the prey growing exponentially means that x prime is r times, let's say, uh, r times x. And the predator decaying exponentially means that y prime is negative u times y. So this is what would happen if you remove the other one. So that gives us equation x prime equals r times x and y prime equals minus u times y. And now we need other terms that represent the interaction of x and y. So I claim that I'm going to put a term minus s x y up here and a term plus v x y down here. And let me try to reason through this. So this term says that when we have y, the rate of change of x is going to be is going to decrease by some amount. And and the, the rate that it decreases is going to be proportional to both the population of x and the population of y. And that makes sense because if you double the amount of of rabbits, then you're going to, if you double the food source for the foxes, you're going to double how many, roughly how many they eat and kill. But if you double the amount of predators, if you double the hunters, you're also going to roughly double how many rabbits get killed. So this is again, is called a mass action term, and it's negative. And this term here is positive for this similar reason. So if you double the amount of, of uh, rabbits, then you're going to double the amount of food that they eat, and if you double the amount of, of hunters, you're going to double, and then the population is going to grow faster as well. So this is just a basic model. You can, instead of, you, you can change growing exponentially to growing logistically if you want to, and if you, if you do that here, oh, that's what we'll do in the next slide, but if you do that, then you just replace that with a logistic equation. So let's do that now x prime equals, so the logistic equation is r times x times 1 minus x over m. And exponential decay, as before, is just minus u y. And then we have to add these mass action terms, so a minus s x y and a plus v x y. So here's the predator-prey equation where the prey grows logistically, which is right here. Now, as before, we can rewrite these equations as follows. We can factor out an x from the first one 
and write x prime equals uh, x times, let's see, epsilon 1 minus sigma, what I used before, sigma, what, it was sigma 1 times x minus, and then what was the constant? I think I used alpha 1 times y, and then I can write y prime as y times epsilon 2 minus sigma 2 y minus alpha 2 y. So I can still, whether it's logistic or exponential, I can still write my equations like this. Um, now let's see how that's going to change. If, if the growth is logistic, then epsilon 1 is equal to r, sigma 1 is equal to r over m, and alpha 1 is equal to s. But if it, if, if it were just exponential, and this term is was just rx, the only difference is that this sigma 1 is going to be 0 instead of r over m. So this is the this form here is just the, the general form of of an equation modeling two species and based on the values of these constants you can change them to be predator prey or competing species or or some combination of the two. Finally, I should mention that when you hear predator and prey you think prey is small and predator is huge, but it doesn't have to be like that. This could m model a host and a parasite. So maybe the prey are deer and the predator are deer ticks. So you can think of that as a, as a parasite. So without the, the deer, the deer ticks are going to die off exponentially. And without the deer ticks, the population of deer are going to grow logistically, but having the ticks are going to kill some of them off. Finally, I want to finish with two more examples of population models, which both arise as special cases of the more general framework that I just showed you for various values of the constants. So for this first one, we have two populations which are fighting and killing each other. So suppose x of t is the population of immune cells, and y of t is the level of an infection in your body, so like bacteria or a virus. Now, both of these are fighting and killing each other, so these mass action terms are both negative. So, for example, this first one represents the negative effect on the immune system from fighting. But also, notice that this term, this is, x. if y were not there, then you don't need the immune cell, so they're not going to be growing. So, x prime is it's not exponential growth in x, it's not r times x, but it's r times y. Because the immune response is proportional, not to its own population, but to the infection level. However, the infective, infective agent, infection, that would grow exponentially without the immune system. The last example that we will do is almost the opposite of the previous one. Now we have two populations that mutually help each other out. So let's consider as an example a population of sharks and a population of feeder fish. So the, the sharks will eat the feeder fish, and so that helps them out. But the feeder fish um, eat dead skin off the shark or eat f scraps of food from the sharks, um, are dependent on the sharks for their habitat. So both of these populations benefit by having the other one around. So you have positive mass action terms here. Now in this example, we are assuming that the sharks grow logistically and the feeder fish uh, would decay exponentially without the sharks. So in other words, the feeder fish are dependent on the sharks, but not vice versa. And of course, there are many examples where we could change, assume they are both logistic or both exponential or something like that. Other such relationships in nature might include lichen and tree populations. 
leaf cutter ants and the fungi that they cultivate, or even something like fruit trees and birds.